you can now find me on Roadster, the app connecting people through cars. Hello everybody, I am, perhaps unsurprisingly, frequently asked about what the best car to buy is given a certain budget. The truth is that's always a very difficult thing to answer because you never know what someone's requirements may be. However, there are certain cars that seem like relatively obvious choices for a do-all vehicle. And what I'm driving today could be the answer to the question, what is the best all-round petrol head friendly car that you can buy for less than £20,000. Today's car is the Mark III facelift Skoda Octavia VRS. Skoda is a brand that I've always been aware of, but rarely actually got to experience or understand. My first Skoda experience didn't exactly leave me all that impressed. A friend very kindly lent me his superb 280 4x4 DSG. That's the slightly bigger estate car that they do, which is frankly cavernous inside, and that's the exact reason I'd borrowed it. I'd bought something on eBay that was fairly bulky and wanted to go and collect it myself. He suggested taking the Superb because it was the ideal car for that kind of task. However, despite it being the top of the line L and K model, I was a little bit let down by the slightly subpar interior, but more than that, the drivetrain that really did not suit the kind of car it was in. For me, a large, luxurious car should have a big engine that feels effortless at all times. But the Superb's Golf R-derived engine was a total mismatch for it. In a small, darty and agile hot hatch, it worked very well, but in a big car, it simply didn't suit. But that was nothing compared to the fuel economy. Driving the car almost exclusively on the motorways at very sensible speeds using eco mode, I only achieved 32 to the gallon. The same journey I did then later in an RS6 and got 29. And that was a car with double the cylinders and double the power, leaving the Skoda seeming a touch underwhelming. In the intervening time, I've driven a few more, including on the channel, and started to find a lot to like. I appreciate the little details like the parking ticket holder up here, the ice scraper and the fuel filler cap, and their attention to detail when it comes to little things like in-car storage. Mike, who's very kindly brought this car down to me today, is active on piston heads. In particular, there's a thread that discusses YouTubers where I'm reasonably active. So if you happen to be one of the people in that forum who've spoken to me, hello. This is, I believe, Skoda number 14 for Mike. However, unlike some, his love affair with the brand is one that started reasonably late in life. He tried many other different marks, but eventually found himself in a little Skoda Fabia about 20 years ago, and realized that it presented a very good combination of ability, practicality, and all in a package that didn't cost an awful lot. Excuse me, what's going on? Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, it's your new car, sir. Oh no! I'm afraid some little vandal has stuck a Skoda badge on the front of it, sir. I'm really sorry. Since then, he's owned a number of different models, including several Octavias, but this is his first VRS. And I have to say, there is a lot to like about this car. The task of building something like this is really not an easy one, and I do have an appreciation for just how tricky it must be for a manufacturer to get it right. Because the fact is, these are cars that are genuinely expected to do everything and do it well. Your more entry-level products have a bit of an easier time of things because they simply need to be affordable, practical, economical, easy to drive, and accessible to all who need them. Then at the top of the tree, things are easier again because a car is going to be judged instead on right quality, how many toys and gadgets it has, how many acres of leather are in the cabin, and things like price are far less of a concern. If your 7 Series does 1 MPG less than the equivalent S-Class, nobody cares. The same again for supercars, because they're such an irrational purchase, the fact that the handbrake might be in a silly place on one of them or the other doesn't have a lot of boot space isn't really a very much concern to many people. But this needs to be practical, sensible, easy to drive, reliable, 
and also quick and fun. And that's very, very tricky. But I've got to say, I think the Skoda's doing a pretty damn good job. We'll start with the boring stuff. We'll begin with the exterior. And I have to say, this is actually a pretty good looking car, particularly in its state guise and this lovely bold red shade. It actually works really quite well. I don't think it's going to win any awards for its styling, but it has a little bit more personality than say the VW or Audi equivalent, but isn't quite as showy or flashy as say a Seat. In truth, over the last few years, VW have gotten a little braver and more angular with their styling, and Audi have somewhat lost the plot with some of their models. This strikes a really nice balance, and I think it's a very, very easy car on the eyes. It's also sized just about perfectly. You stand next to it and it just doesn't feel like a particularly big car. That's important because of late an awful lot of cars have been getting fairly big. I recently spent some time in a BMW 5 Series, and although it wasn't as difficult to place on the roads as I had feared, it is still a very long car, and you'll struggle in many a car park. This is usefully shorter, yet inside doesn't feel like it's suffered that much. The boot, while not quite as generous as the Superb, is still very good, rear seat space is ample, and up front feel like I'm in a normal sized car. This is a very, very close relative of the Mark 7 Golf and the third generation Audi A3. This is not an inherently bad thing though, because up front under the bonnet you will find the familiar EA888 four cylinder, two litre turbocharged engine, which here produces 230 horsepower. A diesel VRS also exists, but this is the petrol model, and the one that I think these days is gonna appeal to most people. The petrol, in Britain at least, I'm told, was available only in front wheel drive guys. But with this amount of power and practice, I don't think that's much of a concern. You also had a choice of gearboxes with a manual or DSG, both being six speed. I'm a little surprised that the DSG isn't the later seven speed item, but in fairness, this still works pretty well. Modifications made to this car are purely cosmetic. So there's some black badging, the 230 decals on the side are Skoda items, but taken from another car. And inside you've got some little carbon extensions for the gear shift paddles, which are a very nice and welcome addition. On the motorway and driven sensibly, in excess of 40 mpg can be achieved with this car and because it's newer, the road tax is only about £155 a year. It's new enough that you can get it with a manufacturer's warranty, which means you shouldn't really have to worry too much about any unexpected bills. The pre-facelift model was introduced, I think, in around 2012, so it's now getting on a bit. And that means if you're going to buy one, particularly privately, it's probably worth seeking out a buyer's guide to see if there are any common failure points. The fact is, I don't really expect there to be all that many, because by the time this was in production, VW really did know what they were doing. The fact this car is made in the Czech Republic should do absolutely nothing to dissuade anybody, because they are just as capable of putting a car together as well as any of the German competition. I also really appreciate this car's blend of old and new when it comes to all of your touch points in here. So up top you've got a fairly modern looking system which can work with Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, but it also has its own apps and nav should you need those. Will of course pair with just about any phone on the market and works very well and much like any other VW product. However, unlike some more modern cars, for most of the rest of the controls you've got a button or a dial or a switch. It's all very simple, all very logical. The steering wheel controls now do feel a little bit out of date and there are certain pieces of switch gear in here that you recognize from fairly old vehicles, but none of this really detracts from it. Yes, sure, the door tops aren't leather covered and the headlining here is a little bit oppressive and there isn't a panoramic sunroof in this particular car. That does take away from it and that's something I would really like. These seats are fabric, but I have to say, I like the styling, they actually work quite well, they support you nicely and they seem pretty comfortable for longer journeys too, something that Michael has confirmed. The seats are all manual with no electric adjustment and therefore no memory setting. This isn't going to be a problem for some, but for others who regularly change drivers in their car, I know having memory seats has saved a few relationships. That then is all the boring stuff covered, and the Octavia for me scores pretty highly as a regular daily driver. This though is an Octavia VRS, so doing the boring bit well is only half of the picture. What about when you want to have fun? Well, let's pop it into sport mode. 
we'll put it in manual. We have VRS drive select here. The individual settings are set much as you might expect. So steering is sport, it's a little bit heavier. I actually don't mind it. The drive mode is normal, that's what I'd have. The dynamic cornering lights you can adjust why lights have got a sporty setting, I do not know. The air conditioning is normal, but there's no sport setting for that, only eco. And the engine sound is set to sport. This car has the sound act door system, so it's a very artificial noise coming through. But as this car's owner is partially deaf, he does rather appreciate it. Notable by its absence is any sort of adjustment for the dampers, because this car has a passive setup. And that's very, very good because I found in many previous VW products, the presence of the dynamic chassis control, as it's called for VW, Skoda, I don't know what they call it, doesn't always work that well. Yes, in terms of the ride, it's absolutely fine and it does make the cars a little bit more comfortable and perhaps a little bit more year-round tolerable. However, I found it can rob a car just a little bit of that interaction and excitement. Let's see how the Skoda fares. In terms of outright pace, it's certainly ample, as you might imagine, because it's based on the Golf platform, but is a large car, it carries a little bit more weight. A Golf R, even a totally standard one, would have absolutely no trouble whatsoever leaving this behind. But that's not to say this is incompetent, it's actually rather enjoyable. The thing that surprises me most is when you begin to press on, just how comfortable it becomes. At lower speeds, there's a little bit of firmness to the suspension, which you would expect in a sportier car. And there are many sporty vehicles that when you do start to push on, the suspension comes together, it all starts to make sense. I've said this in many, many reviews, but this becomes really, truly, genuinely comfortable. At lower RPM, the engine does sound fairly agricultural. And to be honest, get it to the pointy end of the rev counter, which is only about 6,000 RPM, and it doesn't sound great. The sporty steering, while it has added some weight, I don't think has really added any feel, but I don't have too many issues with it. Grip level is good, if not amazing. Oh, wow. Even in manual mode, kick down is still active. That I don't like. And the engine actually went well into its red zone and revved to near 7,000 RPM. Evidently the red line a little bit higher than I thought. Having only six ratios also means that the car, when you change gear, sometimes winds up revving a lot more than you might have anticipated. There is a very small amount of lag in this engine, but it's very linear, very predictable, and it always seems to have an answer. It's certainly flexible, although with the sound act door and its sporty setting, when you do put your foot down at lower RPM, it's making part of this interior buzz. That's rather disappointing. With the steering in its normal mode, it is unfortunately very typical VW, which is to say, there is next to nothing coming back through the wheel. The chassis does a reasonable job of communicating grip levels to you, and it's certainly capable, but not the last word in engagement. It's one of those cars where you find yourself in a bend and you think you're really giving it some, you look down and work out that you're carrying about 20 mile an hour less than you thought you were. And this is not necessarily a bad thing. Special mention has to go to the suspension, it really does. It may not be the sharpest, stiffest, lowest car on the block, but if you want to get from A to B relatively quickly, but still in comfort, it strikes an exceptionally good balance. Many petrol heads I know would look at something like this and think, well, if you're gonna go and do that, you may as well buy a Passat R36, of which I recently drove an example, and it was a car that, like this, had many fine qualities and can do the fun and the boring bit in equal measure. This, I would say, did the boring thing a little bit better than the Passat. However, the R36 rewarded with a powertrain that genuinely did put a smile on your face. To get into one of those is likely to cost you around 12 to 13 grand for a decent one, and one of these right about now is around 18. As with many cars out there, these are now worth the same, if not more than they were two years ago. The major benefit for some potential buyers though, will be the fact that this car was made in 2017. And that's significant, because it means that it does have many safety systems and upgrades and things that came as technology moved on. But it isn't then blighted with some of the regulatory stuff that was introduced in 2018, like the petrol particular filter, or the fact that when you turn the safety systems like lane assist off on this car, 
they stay off. Whereas a modern Skoda, you're gonna have to go through menus and things to turn it off every single time you get in the car. I appreciate the little touches like the sliver of carbon here, the nicely styled seats, the slightly more aggressive looking dials, and the car's overall level of refinement and comfort. It is a very, very good daily. And though it may not have the performance or all weather ability of a Golf R, it also doesn't and didn't command the same price. One of these would make an excellent choice for a younger person who needs that dual car and doesn't perhaps have the budget or the desire for something like the Golf. And it would also make an excellent all-rounder or even second vehicle for somebody that has something a bit sportier, more special for the weekends and needs something reasonably sensible for the weekdays. The phrase jack of all trades, master of none, is often wheeled out as an insult, but it applies here and in a rather complimentary way. There is, steering feel aside, no one thing about this car which is bad. There's plenty about it which is good, a few things which are great, and that's more than enough, I think, to justify its place in the world. And the combination of the little extra touches you get, plus the lower price, mean that for me, the Skoda as a very worthwhile alternative to a more mainstream VW or Audi. And I'm also of the age that I really appreciate the ad campaign they ran about two decades ago, because it was the best ever. Anyway, that's enough from me. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.